Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall and this is episode 106 on herpetology with Professor Susan Evans of University College London. So firstly, apologies for not sticking to our usual release schedule. I got called out to work on the rigs at the end of November, and then I spent most of December actually working, and then flew over the festive period and a couple of interviews that didn't really work out. But we're back. We're back on course, and 2020 should be an excellent year for PaleoCast. And kicking us off this year is the latest member of our team, so I'd like to introduce you all to Elsa. Hi, nice to meet you. Welcome, welcome to the team. So, can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself, please? Yeah, of course. I'm delighted to be joining PaleoCast, helping to bring our listeners some regular doses of extinct goodness. Um, So, my name is Elsa Pancharoli. I'm a postdoctoral researcher. I'm fresh out of my PhD at the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. And I'm now part of Roger Benson's lab at the University of Oxford. Cool. And what are you studying? Well, my main interests are biomechanics, systematics and ecology of mammals, the the earliest mammals and their predecessors, so cynodonts, particularly in the Jurassic. Uh, I do a lot of work with micro CT and synchrotron data, so reconstructing fossil skeletons, but also using those data to look at histology and developmental biology. Cool. So um, we've recently had a lot of requests for uh, mammal episodes. Is that something that you'd be that be right up your street then? Or are you looking to branch out and do interviews about pretty much anything? A bit of both. I mean, I am definitely biased. I love mammals and I definitely want to bring you some superb mammal content. But I'd say my interests my interests are, uh, well, they're eclectic. So I'm curious about pretty much everything. And maybe in upcoming episodes of PaleoCast, I could share that curiosity with our equally curious listeners. Awesome. And have you done much outreach work before? Yeah, I do. I do quite a lot of outreach. Lots of, um, of public talks, so with adults, but also with kids. I do things like Scottish fossil workshops. Um, but I also am um, a freelance writer, so I've written in the past for The Guardian, um, and I also write for sort of other magazines and online and print publications. Awesome. And do you have any uh, social media tags for if any of our audience want to follow you in your research? Yeah, I absolutely do. You can find me at G Science Lady. So that's the letter G, uh, Science Lady. Awesome. And so can you tell us about this, uh, your first interview? Who's it with? Why did you choose to do this? Yeah, well, in these interviews, I'd really like to look for contributions from a real diverse range of talented researchers. And I'd like to find people who are extremely experienced, but maybe also people who are really early career. So in this episode, I'm going to speak to Professor Susan Evans, and I'm really excited about this because she's someone who's a leader in her field and a great scientist and who I really admire for her her work. So, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed recording this and I hope our listeners enjoy listening. I'm Elsa Pancharoli and welcome to PaleoCast. Have you ever looked into a garden pond and caught sight of a newt? Well, they're a type of list amphibian and that's the group that includes frogs and Sicilians. Newts belong to the branch we call salamanders and they may look a bit like soggy lizards, but they are of course something quite distinct and far removed from reptiles. But what exactly are salamanders and what did they evolve from? Well, the evolutionary origins of salamanders are one of the biggest mysteries still to be solved by paleontologists. And one of the leading scientists trying to answer this question is paleontologist and herpetologist, Professor Susan Evans from the University College London. Now, Susan is one of the world's leading experts on amphibians and reptiles. She's authored over 150 papers on the subject, is a fellow of the Linnaean Society and a scientific fellow of the Zoological Society. And her work takes her around the world in an effort to understand the evolution of reptiles and amphibians. I'm delighted to be visiting Susan at her lab here at UCL so she can tell us more about these elusive groups. Welcome to PaleoCast, Susan. Thank you. (laughs) So I'd like to start by asking you about your origins. So how did you become to be a paleontologist? 
Um, you know, was it something that you always knew you wanted to do? No, I wanted to be David Attenborough. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> when, I, when I was a kid. Um, no, I went. I didn't really want, know what I wanted to do when I was at school. Played with medicine, veterinary. As I say, I, I really wanted to go and study animals. So I did a degree in zoology. First year, still had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, wasn't overly interested in fossils. Um, preferred sort of small furry things. Uh, and then in the summer of my first year, I read a book by Raymond Dart about his finding of the first, what we now call Australopithecines in South Africa. And I found that very interesting. And then in the first term of my second year, a friend of mine dragged me, really, because I wanted to go fencing, but she dragged me to a seminar that was um, given by Richard Leakey, who, of course, is the paleoanthropologist who works in, in Kenya. His father did a lot of work on the um, Olduvai Gorge. And he had come to the UK having found what we now call the 1470 skull, um, early hominid and he'd come for a conference but he knew the people in the geology department at uh, Bedford College which is where I was and he gave this seminar and I was just so excited I went out of the room absolutely hopping with excitement because it I'd never thought of doing research before and, and this this idea that you could sort of solve the mysteries of the past and this kind of detective work and it just it just thrilled me so I tried to get into hominids and I ended up working on reptiles and amphibians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a very sort of circuitous route to what you do. Yeah. Uh, so there's no specific reason why you've chosen herps. It's just what you've ended up in? Well, yeah, I didn't really choose herps. Herps chose me. So I was looking for a PhD. Um, I happened to meet Kenneth Kermack, who was here at UCL. A lot happened. Some people put me in contact with him. He worked on early mammals and I kind of thought, well, you know, early mammals, I can work my way up to hominids from early mammals. Um, and basically he said, well, I've got an interesting little rhynchocephalian from one of my mammal localities. That would be a good project for you. So I smiled and said, yes, that's great. Went home and looked up what a rhynchocephalian was <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't know. Um, found it was what Sphenodon belonged to, and I knew a bit about Sphenodon, so, well, it seemed like a reasonable place to start. And then once I got going working on that material, you know, once you get going on any project, you find all the questions that there are that need answering, and you just get into it. Um, years later, when I had the opportunity to swap into hominids, I was so fixated on small reptiles that I just wasn't interested in anymore. Want to anymore yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really delighted to have you on PaleoCast. And it's not just because your subject's really fascinating, but also because you're kind of a rarity at the moment, a professor who's female, who's like at the top of your field. Um, and then, of course, at the moment, there's a lot of talk and a lot of drive to address the sort of diversity issues that we have in science. And I wonder, as a female scientist, what experiences you've had getting to where you are today or, or maybe advice that you might have for others? Uh, that's, it's, not, that's not one I think you could, I can answer simply. As far as paleo is concerned, I've never felt that being a female was a big problem. When I was a postgraduate student, there were... OK, not that many women in the UK, but we used to have um, women paleontologists coming from other countries to the UK meetings, particularly from Poland. So at the time, there was uh, Sofia Kivanyabarowska, um, Magdalena Bosa-Bapianika, um, Hasgros Molska, very powerful women scientists who basically were the leads in their institution, and they would come to the UK to the meetings, and I think they were great kind of role models in a sense. Um, so, as I say, I've never felt in the paleo community that being a woman was, was a problem. I guess it's more of a problem in the university system because, A, there are far fewer women, 
in senior positions. Mm. And there has been, perhaps it's changing a little bit, a tendency to sort of push women towards the sort of tutorial roles, the more teaching roles, these kinds of things. And perhaps certainly when I first joined the department, not a great deal of support as far as encouraging um, women to do research, more attendance, as I say, to try and get you to be faculty tutor or to take on those kind of softer roles, whereas it seemed to me that there were men who were being given extra help and sort of push forward. Now, that's not universal. I know that there were other women who, who were doing better. Mm. I, th I hope that's changing a bit. But as we know from the various surveys that, that are done, I think it's still, it, it, you know, it's still difficult, I think, for women um, to get to the more senior positions. Yeah. It's, you know, one of the major problems is the, is the break between doing, at least getting, getting onto a postdoc and then getting from a postdoc into a, you know, a full-time position. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the really big drops because in order to do that, you have to impress interview panels and interview panels tend to be looking for mirror images of themselves to some extent. So they go for the perhaps the brasher, the more self-confident kind of people who can present themselves very confidently. Women, I think, still are not so good at doing that. Mm. And so they may find it more difficult to actually get themselves into those starting positions. Yeah, I'm being in that, that level at the moment myself. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yeah, and um, I, I certainly when I was in that position trying to get, I went to interview after interview after interview yeah. and just didn't do very well at the interview because I wasn't, wasn't good at blagging and sort <laughs> of, you know, <laughs> pretending I was something I wasn't. Whereas some guys, it has to admit, I, I think, you know, do tend to do that to some extent. Yeah, I hope you're right. I, I think it is changing. Yeah, slowly. So, uh, Susan, I introduced you as a paleontologist and a herpetologist. But can you explain to me, what, what is herpetology? What does that mean? Herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians in the sort of, I guess, the more general field, the way that the general public might understand it. So, for example, phylogenetic science, scientifically, we would regard birds as being reptiles. But generally, a herpetologist would not be seen to be would not be understood as, as, you know, looking at birds. So it's kind of non-bird reptiles right. and, and amphibians, essentially. Okay. Um, and uh, there are a sort of around about 16,000 species of, of different kinds of herp, is that right? Which is huge. It, something like that. I haven't okay. added it up, but yeah, there's about 10,000 schoolmates. There's a few dozen crocs. There's a few hundred turtles. I'm not quite sure what the number <laughs> of turtles is. And there are lots and lots of frogs and not as many salamanders and a lot fewer Sicilians. Ah, that is interesting. So, but there, in general, there's a lot of, of these groups. Yeah, they're so very they, successful. They must play a really key role in ecosystems. At the lower levels of the ecosystems, yes, I would guess. I mean, in most cases, these are very small animals. So they can occupy lots of different niches. Obviously, they, you know, they're taking insects. They're, they're, and also they're a food source for a, for a lot of larger things. And I guess in the Mesozoic, at least, they would have been a food source for dinosaurs and larger mammals and various things. Whenever you see an image of small dinosaur running through the sort of Cretaceous of China, it's usually got a lizard in its hand or a lizard in its jaws or something like that yeah am i right that you've had a whole clade of squamates named after you evanosauria yes but i'm not sure it's still valid okay <laughs> <laughs> i think i've probably i've probably been consigned to the sort of you know defunct group <laughs> well the other one i read was that you have an eocene agamid lizard vastanagama suzani 
I do, and I have. And there's a mammal, and there's a rhynchopophalian, and there's one or two other. I think there's a, a one or two more lizard. I think I'm up to about seven. <laughs> that must be pretty <laughs> cool. Quite a diversity of things. That must be pretty. Like, I feel quite an honour to have stuff like well, that. Kind of, I guess. But you know, we all we all name things after. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think the honours are very well deserved. Obviously, you you know you pioneered using cladistics to understand reptiles and amphibians, so it makes sense that people people do that. Um, and you've also worked on some really amazing specimens. So one that really stands out is a giant frog from the late Cretaceous of Madagascar, Bielzebufo ampinga. Uh, can you tell us more about that? Right. Yes. I mean, I has it has to be said that, that my colleagues at, in America kind of went for the largest size estimate and sort of pushed it. Okay. <laughs> um, so I rather came out as being a bit bigger than it probably probably might have done, at least in some of the, the press articles. Yeah, I read online that it could have eaten a baby dinosaur. Well, it, I, I mean, that's probably a really baby, you know, a hatchling of a small dinosaur. It, it kind of, and certainly the, the National Ge- the Geographic magazine image of it was it stuffing its face full of sort of small <laughs> small dinosaurs um i mean large it's probably the size of, of a large pixicephalus which is the african bullfrog um or a large caratophyne frog so yeah it was a sort of getting close to some of the big frogs that so what's the biggest that? frog that in, we in like terms of a pet so like a guinea pig size yeah a guinea pig okay yeah right. something like something like a guinea pig yes yeah. but with a Mostly mouth, <laughs> with a really big mouth, okay. um, and you know a short squat body and probably rather short squat legs. So, caratophyte frogs have basically been described as sort of a mouse mouth on legs, and so Beelzebufo was probably something like you know was sort of that's a mouth on legs and would probably have eaten anything that sort of walked past it. Yeah, it's a great name. <laughs> the, the the name came because when they started to find bits of it, um, the field workers at the time in Madagascar were picking these these kind of bits up, um, and they kind of christened it the sort of devil frog or the you know Beelzebub frog, and so when we came to think of a name for it the, the logical thing to go for we know we play with it it's, do we dare sort of thing. <laughs> Yeah, why not? Let's call it Beelzebubo after Beelzebub. It's kind of... Um, I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> very memorable, which is... It's really very memorable. Yeah. If you look at... If you if you put it up on Wikipedia or, 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 or you know, the ser- various search engines, you look at images, there are lots and lots of cartoons of a frog with sort of, you know, devil's tail and, and horns. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, it was, of course, a frog, so that's a type of lysamphibian. But um, one thing that I've always been puzzled about is the difference between the, using the word amphibian or lysamphibian. Why would you use one and not the other? What does it mean? Well, lysamphibian, lys means smooth. So it means, it literally, it means an amphibian with smooth, with smooth skin. Um, now, of course, Sicilians, we now know, can have sort of little scales um, underneath the sort of under the skin. Um, but the Lysamphibia are the group that contain the modern amphibians. So, you know, frogs, salamanders, Sicilians. Amphibian, in the sort of very general word, is kind of, they're kind of the tetrapods, at least in the older usage, were the tetrapods that sort of weren't either reptiles or mammals. What we would now call paraphyletic group it, because there are different groups now we recognize with phylogenetic analysis we recognize that there are different groups within that the lys amphibians are probably a proper group in other words more related to one another than there are to anything else but that's one of the controversial issues at the moment so there are lots of lineages of ancient amphibians some of which had scales little bony plates in their skin even. And so they probably had tougher skin than modern list amphibians where you've got this smooth, wet skin and they do a lot of gas exchange, for example, through through the skin um, at various times of the year. So, yeah, list amphibia is, is 
as I say, the modern group. Um, amphibians generally are tetrapods that are not reptiles or mammals, but cladistically they are tetrapods that are closer to lithamphibians than to any group of sort of amniotes. Yeah. And then there's all the stuff in the at the bottom of the tree that people call tetrapodomorphs or you know different names for that are not perhaps strictly amphibians but they're sort of tetrapods that are not quite amphibians and not quite amniotes. A bit murky. Murky, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like China's really transformed our knowledge of lots of different groups. I mean, I know working on mammals, it certainly has. Um, is the same true for herbs? It's certainly true for uh, amphibians, or at least for salamanders. Um, before the material started to come out of, of China, probably what we knew of early salamanders could basically have been fitted in a shoebox. So there were fragmentary remains from a few places in North America, in, in Europe, um, one or two specimens from Central Asia, a series of specimens that we, we pulled out of Las Hoyas in Spain, which is another limestone locality in Spain. So that was some nice material, but even so, you know, a, a, up to about 10 specimens rather than sort of dozens. The Chinese material, there are hundreds and really? hundreds of specimens. Um, the deposits of the Jihol biota are rich, really, really rich in amphibians. I mean, you basically dig a little hole in the back of somebody's you know, garden and pull out bits of amphibian. Um, yeah, the, and the preservation, preservation is, is exquisite. So you can see the soft tissues, you can see the, you know, the, the external gills, you can see sometimes the gut contents. Wow. Um, not bad for lizards, but I mean, there are, it's not as good um, for lizards. So there are lots of specimens of one particular lizard thing called Eubenosaurus uh, that we worked on. We now know an awful lot about Eubenosaurus. We know what it ate. We know that it gave live birth because we found specimens with babies inside. Um, we now know it's, it's coloration. We've just got a paper come out that shows it was striped. That's so cool. Um, so, but we, there's less diversity and we know less about some of the rarer taxa. Um, I I'm sure that'll change and it's beginning to change, but um, sal it's salamander heaven. I mean, I saw this uh, amazing larval cryptobranchoid salamander mm. from China, but um, and it had like, a flattened tail and the gills were preserved and it even had a like, belly full mm. of conchostricans. So it was really spectacular. But then I started thinking, like, obviously they have a really interesting life cycle, amphibians. So how do you, in the fossil record, uh, make sense of that you might find a fossil that was perhaps not actually a fully grown adult because they go through this metamorphosis, don't they? Um, how do you piece that sort of thing together? Well, maybe first, could you tell us a little bit about that life cycle and then how you make sense of it in the fossil record? Well, I mean, one of the things that characterises modern list amphibians is, of course, they go through this metamorphosis. So the eggs are generally laid in water or in a wet environment. They generally hatch out into tadpoles, little water-living tadpoles that have external gills. Then they, those mature and typically then they would lose the external gills and then they would turn into a land living adult that was breathing with lungs. Various groups have got around that. So some frogs, for example, get around the tadpole stage, which is obviously a vulnerable stage by mouth brooding, holding the eggs in their mouths, burying them in their backs, carrying them around, doing all sorts of strange things, putting them in little pools up in trees to get, a, to get around this idea. Salamanders, there's less of that sort of diversity of, of behaviour, but what a number of salamander groups do is simply not go through metamorphosis. So they remain as in the juvenilized form with external gills, but become sexually mature in that form. 
And so you get something that looks like a larval form, but is sexually mature and is able to breed. Sometimes they can switch between between the different morphs. So, you know, you might have one that is usually seen with external gills, but if you pop it into a different environment, perhaps that's got a different, you know, it's got more iodine in the water or something like this, then they will grow up and they'll metamorphose into into an ordinary, kind of ordinary salamander. Um, oh, that's incredibly flexible. There is a flexibility in it, but then that's, that's cool. of course, there's an advantage to that because it means that they, they can occupy um, aquatic environments, but they can also potentially, at least in some cases, but not all cases, metamorphose um, and, and go on to land if the environment is not, is not right. But you're right, it, it causes huge problems in terms of working the phylogeny of these things because a number of different groups have evolved that strategy of what we call pedomorphosis, in other words, being able to be sexually mature in a juvenilized body form. And there's lots of different groups that have done it independently. And so if you try and run a morphological analysis where you try and use morphological characters, anatomical characters, in order to work out relationships then there's a real danger that all of your pedomorphic forms are going to fall together. Oh, yeah. And as you say, you've also got the problem if you find one fossil that's clearly of a pedomorphic form, what you don't know necessarily is whether this is a sexually mature form of one or whether you've got a baby that's going to grow up and go into something else. So you've got to try and use modern taxa, modern animals, to see if you can work out from the degree of skeletal development whether it's likely to be mature or not. But even then, if it's pedomorphic, if it's, if it's juvenilized, then the chances are its skeleton isn't as well ossified anyway, even as an adult. And so it does cause a lot of problems. Well, that seems like a really good point for me to make a confession to our listeners that this is actually not the first time that I've met Susan. I'm actually um, currently a very small cog in a fantastic project that Susan's heading up with colleagues, which is actually trying to understand the origins of salamanders. Now, my role is very small. I segment CT scans of living salamanders in order to make a database for experts like Susan to use. So, Susan, I've been sitting for weeks now, (laughs) segmenting scans and making models of extant salamander bones for you and for your colleagues. Why am I doing this? Uh, can you tell me about your salamander project and how that database that I'm, make, I'm helping make is going to be used? Okay, so two different bits of this. First of all, what the general project is. So one of the problems that we have in understanding the origins of all modern list amphibians is that there is a big temporal gap. There's a big time gap separating the first fossil records of frogs, salamanders and Sicilians from the groups from which they may have originated. That is, is, has been for a long time and is continuing to cause all kinds of problems and discussions and controversies as to which group of those ancient amphibians our modern salamanders may have come from, and indeed whether they all came from the same groups of of fossil amphibians or whether they came from several different groups and there are different opinions as to whether that that is. So one of the the key things that we need to do, and it's exactly the same with, with lizards and with a number of other groups, is to try and fill that temporal gap and try and find the intermediates. So the earliest examples of salamanders, Sicilians, frogs, lizards, in order to try and better understand what characters they've got so that we can try and track back and recognise what the the ancestors are likely to be. There's a big problem with frogs, but at least we have one or two very early frogs. With salamanders, the first really good material of salamanders that you get at least until some of the Chinese material came, were from sort of the latter part of the Jurassic period. So 
140 million years, that sort of time. Um, some of those looked very primitive, but there's one specimen from Central Asia, some rather fragmentary material from, from Russia. Now we have all this Chinese material, but the interesting thing is that the Chinese material, for the most part, seem to belong either to modern groups or to ones that seem to be quite close to modern groups. So they look r rather like modern salamanders in their skeletal anatomy. They don't look particularly primitive. So even though some of them are quite old, they don't help us link salamanders to anything in the past. What we, what we want to try and find are some of the more primitive salamanders so that we can see what, what characteristics they may have that will help us to track back and, and identify the groups from which they come. Now, many years ago, we started to work with material in from Oxfordshire, and there are one or two quarries, both in Oxfordshire and also in other parts of, sort of central UK, that yield the remains of Middle Jurassic, 165, 166 million year old, fragmentary material of lizards, of frogs, of some salamanders and various other things that were important because they filled a gap already that we, there was very little material known. As far as the salamanders from that period, we could recognise that there were several different types of salamander and we could fit some bones and sort of say, well, we think these belong to this taxon and these ones probably belong to something else but never enough to really get a good idea as to how, what they might have looked like. Never enough pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, if you like, to actually visualise what this animal might have been like and therefore try and fit it into a phylogeny. As you know, the great thing now is that, you know, there's this locality on the Isle of Skye. We did some work there some years ago. Um, an earlier group, partly from Bristol, um, Michael Waldman, um, who was a teacher at Stowe School, had done some work there and had found some fossil remains there, some of which were, were associated specimens of things that we were finding uh, in Oxfordshire. Subsequent work more recently there, particularly by um, Roger in, in, in Oxford, um, Roger Benson, and the group he's been leading, now is finding a lot more really great associated material. And so what our project is, is from the fossil side to CT scan that material, to segment it out. Again, my postdoc, Mark Jones, is also spending weeks, months sitting there segmenting out fossil material. Um, and there's some really great material and we're gonna get some really beginning to understand what these things look like. We're going to be able to actually print out, um, you know, copies of the bones and put the bones together and get a much clearer idea of what some of these things are like. And some of them seem to be really primitive. And so I'm really, really excited about what we're, what we're finding. So that's one, one aspect of it. The, the other problem that, that we have in terms of doing morphological making morphological trees, in other words, basing trees on morphological characters, is that really we have not a great deal of understanding of the variation in shape of different bones within salamanders. So, for example, if I compare it with, with lizards, there's been a lot of work done on skulls in lizards, there's been a reasonable amount of work done on the postcranial skeleton of lizards. So we have a reasonable idea of how particular bones in lizards vary depending on which group they belong to. We know a lot less about how different bones in different amphibian groups vary and whether or not there are characteristic shapes for different families of salamanders, for example. So that if you find salamander bones in a fossil locality, there is really very little to compare it with to think about 
well, does this particular vertebrate, does it tell me anything about which group of modern salamanders it could belong to? Or does it tell me anything about how vertebrae might have evolved and differentiated in modern salamanders? Because we don't have a good handle on the degree of variation that you get in vertebral morphology, in scapular coracoid morphology, in pelvic morphology, in humerus morphology. And so for that reason, if you look at data matrices where people have listed characters that they're going to use for trying to assess which group a particular amphibian might belong to, the characters are not very good. And so you see things being clumped together within, for example, cryptobranchid, which is the sort of large amphibians that, that you get in China and Japan, for example, like the giant salamander. People grouping things with those on the basis just of one or two characters that are almost certainly convergent. And so the reason that we wanted, alongside working on the fossil material, to make a really comprehensive atlas of modern skeletal material in salamanders was to provide a resource that we can use to try and identify new characters that we can use in developing the phylogeny, but also to provide to produce an, an online resource where somebody who's found perhaps some salamander remains in a fossil locality can flip through and look at a series of images and say, ah, I can see, yes, mine looks rather like, like that. Um, and so that may be what my, my sort of particular bone belongs to. Well, yes, I've got a frontal bone from the skull and I've got a jaw and I've got that. And this, they all fit into perhaps it belongs to that family. So it's a, 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 a mixture of trying to provide a resource that people can use to try and identify their material, but also to try and get a handle on the variation and whether there is any significant variation that we can use in order to try and understand um, which group things might belong to. But also from the other perspective that we were talking about previously, which is trying to understand how bone shape changes through development so that perhaps we are better able to recognise whether that's a juvenile bone and how much a particular bone shape might change between the aquatic form that's got a scapula, that's, that's got its shoulder girdle, and how that shoulder girdle might change if it becomes metamorphosed, if it becomes, you know, a fully adult form. Yeah. To, to, yes, to try and understand the variation. So that's why you're sitting there <laughs> <laughs> trying to, to, you know, prepare all of those. Because I think, you know, what I would like to see is, you know, 50 or 60 scapula shoulder girdles so that we can see whether there's those variation, but also to look at the shoulder girdle perhaps in, you know, 20 or 30 of the same genus to see how much variation there is within a particular oh, yeah. species or across a particular range. Because again, you know, we look at a bone and say, well, it's different from that one. But if you, unless you know the range of individual variation, you can't, it's very difficult to say, well, that's a new species because it's got that extra knob on it that that one hasn't got. But perhaps that's just normal variation within a particular within a particular group. I've certainly been quite struck with how, um, I think they're, they're not actual variation. It's not variation I'm seeing, but weird mutations where a vertebrae, half of the vertebrae will be kind of a weirdly fused and things like that. And I keep thinking, how does this animal survive? They seem to be able to survive with quite a lot of very strange things gone wrong with their <laughs> skeleton. <laughs> is, is that a fair thing to say? I mean, in mammals, I don't think we see it so often. That, that, that's, in, I mean, that's an interesting observation that obviously is something we, we, we should kind of think about, um, you know, as, as we're going along. But as far as vertebral morphology is concerned, what it... what. Certainly the work that's been done on, on mammals suggests that they are far more constrained in what they do as far as their vertebrae are concerned than, than other groups. So, for example, you know, mammals are much more constrained as to vertebral numbers. So virtually every mammal has the same number of neck vertebrae, mm. whereas 
in reptiles and birds, you can have any number of neck vertebrae. There isn't the same constraint operating. Why this is, there's a lot of speculation as to, as to why it is. So but maybe the more so-called advanced you get, the less flexibility there is as far as you know what you can do with your body and still manage to survive. Who knows, that's just speculation. Uh, you mentioned earlier that there were competing theories about where salamanders actually sit in, in the, the group. So could you maybe summarise what those different theories are and uh, you know where do we currently stand on their origins? What's the favourite theory? Um, I'm not sure there's a favourite theory. Um, it depends on who you speak to. If you do molecular analyses, then... Sicilian salamanders and frogs come out as more closely related to one another than any of them do to, for example, the amniotes and the amniotes of the group of reptiles, birds, mammals. Whereas there are some theories out there that Sicilians particularly might be more closely related to a group of amphibians that are on the stem of amniotes. So if we if we look back at ancient, at the sort of ancient amphibians, just to call them that for the moment without using too, too much of a technical term, among them, there is a kind of broad division into a group that are called the lepospondyls. The name is not that important, but generally now there's a feeling that that group may lo lie closer to the stem of the amniotes, which are the reptiles, the birds, the mammals. Whereas there is another group which is called the temnospondyls, and many people, but not everyone, thinks that those amongst those are the ancestors of the modern amphibians. That, if you like, is the kind of standard view, and that all of the modern amphibians are more closely related to, to one another than they are to any other ancient group, and that they all derived from that Temnus model lineage. However, there are other people who argue either that all of Lys amphibians actually come from the Lepus model group, and therefore are more closely related to the stem of amniotes, and that all these temnus bundles are just random mixed up things. And then there are others that argue that perhaps the Sicilians belong to the lepus bundle group, whereas the frogs and the salamanders are derived from the temnus bundles. And so they are not actually that closely related to one another. Now, if that is the case, then using molecular evidence, that would predict that if you were to run an analysis with looking at amniotes, Sicilians, frogs, and salamanders, that the Sicilians should group with the amniotes in molecular analyses, whereas the other two should group together and be quite separate. Now, in fact, when you do a molecular analysis, all of the list amphibians group together so that tends to counter the idea, although it hasn't destroyed it completely because there are still some people who will argue for it, tends to counter the idea that the Sicilians are separate from the frogs and salamanders. But that still leaves debate as to where those, where the Lys amphibians come from or whether they come from the Lepus bundle line or whether they come from the Tempus bundle line. Um, and as I say, part of the problem there is that you've got this big temporal gap between the two. And if you run an analysis, it depends on whose data matrix you use. So this is why we loop back to the exactly. importance of data matrices. The importance of data matrices. So two data matrices apparently coding exactly the same groups of animals. You run an analysis, and in one case you will get the Lys amphibians coming out with the Lepus bundles, and in another case, when you do it, you get them coming out with the Temnus bundles. So there's something happening in the way that they're coding or the way that the characters are being interpreted that is that is creating that, that issue. 
what one hopes is that perhaps if we can fill in more of the details of the intermediates, then that that might just help to sort out some of that. Because of the long temporal gap, you can have odd things happening. So perhaps if we get a better understanding of what really primitive salamanders look like, or whether indeed these things that we're getting from sky are primitive salamanders or whether they're primitive less amphibians of some sort, because sometimes when you run the matrix, they fall out of salamanders completely and fall down onto the stem. Um, maybe that will help us begin to, you know, adding that extra, those extra taxa into the data matrix may perhaps help to, to consolidate things. Although I'm not totally hopeful that that's going to be the case. <laughs> well, I hope so. Well, we've talked lots about the salamander origins um, and that project. Of course, you've got lots and lots of different projects on the go. Uh, is there anything else you're currently exploring that you would like to tell our listeners about? Um, well, we're working on, we're working on lots of different things. Um, so, with um, with colleagues in China, I'm working on other animals that come from the deposits that the Chinese specimens come from. Um, so it's a, there's a little group of aquatic reptiles called the Charistodes, and they are particularly well represented in Eastern Asia. It seems to have been the sort of centre of activity in the early part of the Cretaceous and the, and the, and the Jurassic. So we're working on new material from um, those deposits, but also recently started to work on some material that comes from a coal mine, um, slightly younger material. Uh, where, where we're getting lizards, um, we're getting charistodes, and so I mean, it literally is in coal. You can't see anything virtually from the surface, but again, if you put it in a CT scanner, then you you can see an awful lot more. We've just submitted a paper on on a new charistodes from um, from one of those those coal mines. So that's certainly one area that we're working with, working also with Chinese colleagues on some lizard material from uh, later in the Cretaceous, but also the other side past the end Cretaceous extinction. And that's particularly interesting, I think, because a lot of our ideas about what survived the end Cretaceous extinction come from North America, where, where you can follow through from the late Cretaceous into the early part of the, into the Paleocene. Um, Whereas in other parts of the world, and particularly in Eastern Asia, there has been fantastic deposits yielding small reptiles, lizards, from the late Cretaceous. But we know very little about the Paleocene faunas from those regions. Mm. And so we can see what was there and the diversity that was there in the late Cretaceous. What we don't know is what survived it. And whether it's different from the pattern that we're seeing in North America. So most of what's been written, for example, about the fate of lizards across the Cretaceous tertiary boundary is based in North America. In Europe, we know a lot about the Paleocene, but we don't know very much about the late Cretaceous. So we really don't know too much about what survived in European localities. And as I say, in Asia, it's the other way around. We know a lot about the late Cretaceous, but we know very little about the Paleocene. And so one of the things that my, certainly one of my colleagues there has been trying to do, and we've done a bit of work on it, is, is trying to explore more localities in the Paleocene so that we can try and understand what the, what the lizard faunas of the Paleocene were like so that we've got a better idea um, as to what was happening across that transition in, in Asia. So that's, that's something else. Um, and then, what else am I doing? All sorts of things. Um, I, That's a really interesting thing, though, with you saying that. It makes me realise that we're always talking at the end Cretaceous mass extinction. We're always talking about dinosaurs and mammals because people do see it as, this, as, if, there's, as if those are the only two groups that really matter across that boundary. But what, what did happen? What is the current uh, understanding of what happened to parts of all different kinds? Well, again, it, it, you know, it varies a lot. We don't because we don't know an awful lot about 
small hurts in general across some of these these boundaries. I mean, it looks, you know, as though this amphibians, for example, almost didn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yet, you know, frogs, we get frogs going through, we get salamanders going through, we get Sicilians clearly going through. Um, and yet all the stuff about acid rain and all of the things that, you know, are supposed to result in from this this catastrophic event you would have thought would have affected vulnerable things like small weak skinned less amphibians yeah but i think part of the problem again is that we don't know enough about the faunas before it and we don't know enough about them after it in different parts of the world really to be able to understand what's happening as far as lizards are concerned we know that some groups went the mosasaurs the big marine reptiles um, the big marine lizards um, seem to have become extinct whether at the boundary or certainly coming up to the boundary there's also a group of large primarily herbivorous lizards um, which are known from north america and asia the polyglyph anodonts they seem to have gone other groups again you know don't really seem to have noticed. I mean, you know, there was a paper recently that plotted out individual kind of taxa and, and said that you know, there had been extinction in particular lineages, and that may be the case. There's also a problem that if you, there's a tendency, if you've got a small, not very well preserved specimen from the late Cretaceous, and then you've got something that looks a bit like it, from the Paleocene, to give the one in the Paleocene a different name, whether, whereas in fact it, it could be a lineage that, that kind of is going straight through. So I think the main, you know, we just don't know enough about faunas on both sides, and especially we don't know enough about other parts of the world other than North America, which of course was the bit that was closest to, you know, to, to the event. Um, you know, what was happening in New Zealand, what was happening in Australia, a long way from the event, what was happening in Asia. Um, it, it's a lot less clear. So on Twitter, I asked people um, if they had any suggestions for questions that they wanted to ask you. <laughs> and Ethan Kochak said he would like to ask, what is the best salamander and why is it axolotls? <laughs> I think you might be a trifle biased. <laughs> you might be a trifle biased. <laughs> so I thought, Susan, let's finish up by asking you, what's your favourite herb and why? Okay. I mean, I'll deal with the axolotls first. <laughs> um, I have a... I give a lecture to, to the first year students about um, respiration and gas exchange. And I talk to them about... You know, the transition onto land and how you know gills are great but they're only any good in water and so I have a great picture that I show up to illustrate gills which is an axolotl it looks just like a Pokemon character and, and everybody always goes oh cool um, so axolotls yeah they're cute um, what's my favourite herb oh it's difficult I change my mind a lot um Mostly it's, well, there's the cute ones. Geckos, cute. I like geckos. There's just something really cute about geckos. Um, I like Draco. Draco is the little Indonesian one with long ribs that glides. Oh. They are so cool. Um, there's the Moloch, which is an Australian sort of spiky one that has fantastic dentition and crawls around eating ants. What about fossils? Fossils. What's my favourite? Because you did a lot of work, uh, sort of the pioneering work at Kirtlington here in England. Yes. Middle Jurassic stuff. So is it one of them or are they too fragmentary to make it into the top list? <laughs> <laughs> With fossils, I, I would have to, I think, to step outside either lizards or modernist amphibian groups with the fossils it, it's got to be up and up oh yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> so these for people who don't know this is another group of amphibians 
possibly related to Lys amphibians that almost made it through to the to the present day. We we picked them up in Curlington in the Middle Jurassic, which is one of the earliest places that we find them. And then they go right through into the Pliocene period, where you find them with modern with modern groups of lizards and, and, and salamanders. But for some reason they disappeared. And they're one of these kind of mystery groups that we're now beginning to sort of unravel gradually. Um, we found the first complete albinopotontic material that was known in Las Hoyas in Spain, um, which we got into nature. It's the only time I've managed to get a paper in nature. Um, <laughs> I suppose salamanders and harps don't catch they, they, the they, don't, they don't, unless it's something that people know about, like geckos or snakes or something like that. Um, and that can lead to a load of rot being written. Um, <laughs> uh, but we're about we're currently working on some really fantastic new albinopotontid material, um, and they are such they are really cool and weird little little critters. Um, so I think they and some of the Caristodes too. That's another that's weird enigmatic little group of reptiles, and again th this is a group that really very very little was known about before. Well, I started doing work on them and realised that some of these smaller things were belong to the same group. And I think now we have a much better understanding, but we still don't know what they're related to. Um, so, yeah, on the amphibian side, I think it's up in a and on the reptile side, probably some of these little caristodeers that we're working on. <laughs> well, thank you so much uh, for uh, agreeing to be on Paleocast. I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs>Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programs, and follow us across social media platforms to get all the latest news. Finally, if you enjoy our podcast, then please explore all of our video content on YouTube and follow our other projects, the Virtual Natural History Museum and the Paleocast Gaming Network.